passing the torch when a great player basically steps down and gives a younger player his spotlight. Something you're gonna inevitably have to do at some point whether you like it or not. You ain't gonna be that guy forever. Some players are reluctant to pass the torch more than others, and it looks like Julius Irving might have been one of them. Before the phrase, the next Jordan was even a thing, Jordan was actually hailed as the next Dr. J when he was arriving on the scene. There was a time when everybody wanted to be like Dr. J, and Jordan was constantly being compared to him, given his high-flying ability and insane athleticism. His moves were reminiscent of the doctor's, crazy dunks and acrobatic layups. So it's not surprising that Julius Irving was Michael Jordan's idol growing up. Up. He looked up to Dr. J, and for good reason. Irving was one of the most dominant players in the 70s and early 80s. He made dunking the ball cool, and even had himself a free throw line dunk before Mike. In fact, this dunk inspired Jordan to do his years later. Julius began his professional career in the ABA, which was the NBA's biggest rival in the 70s, and perhaps the biggest star they had was Dr. J. Before that, that, he was a street legend who gathered huge crowds at Harlem's Rucker Park. Who's your favorite basketball player? Dr. J. Why? All his moves he do. That's why. He drew the greatest crowd in the history of the Rucker Pro League. Of course, Jordan has come out and named several players he idolized, but it looks like Julius was number one. Quote, when I came into the league, I wasn't nearly as enamored with Magic Johnson and Larry Bird as I was with Julius Irving. As a kid, my nickname was Magic, but the only player I really knew about was Dr. J. First person I saw was Julius Irving, and you know, he brought so much creativity to the game. I guess I would have never had those visions if, if I hadn't seen Dr. J in his time. He played above the rim, he played around the rim, underneath. You know, he did a lot of different things, and uh, you have to give the credit to Dr. J. And the doctor, magnificent as usual. By the time Jordan came into the league, Dr. J had already been in the NBA for quite some time, meaning that we unfortunately never got to see these two face off in their primes, given the fact that Irving was in his mid-30s while Jordan was in his early 20s by the time these two collided. But nevertheless, at least they still managed to give us a total of eight meetings for us to enjoy. MJ and Dr. J met four times during Jordan's rookie year. Now, the Sixers won all all four of those games, but boy did Jordan put on a show in the process. He put up 31 points in their third ever matchup, and then put up 40 points in their next meeting after that, including this dunk that was all up in the doctor's grill. Jordan so smooth, look at that. He looked like he accelerated once he got in the air, that's unbelievable. It's like he has a, a jet propeller somewhere. And don't you think that just because MJ respected Dr. J, that there wasn't any trash talking going on? Because there most certainly was. You know, and, and we played against each other. It was like three years where we overlapped. I remember he came down and he dunked on like a whole team. And then I went down and dunked on his team. <laughs> whatever, I was looking at him, he was looking at me. Uh, and he was like, I could do it again, you know. <laughs> Mind you, Philadelphia won six of those eight meetings, but Jordan put up better numbers than Irving. He got the best of him from an individual standpoint, even though Jordan admitted that Julius was the most difficult player to match up with. Quote, I had a couple of good games against Philadelphia during my first season, but I couldn't do anything when I was matched up with Julius, because I had so much admiration 
admiration for him. I was just happy to be on the same floor. Julius could clearly see that MJ's star was rising quickly, but called it quits before MJ really took over the NBA, retiring in 1987. Quote, I caught him before he really hit his stride. When it was all said and done, Irving won three championships, four MVPs, was an 11-time NBA All-Star, and was a three-time scoring champ, and remains one of the most influential players the league has ever seen. Dr. J was one of the guys that I'd idolized from the business side of things, and I wanted to take that same passage you know, and show that I was more than just a basketball player. I had a personality, I had a business mindset. I can coordinate and I can cross all different types of color barriers. But even with an incredible legacy like that, that doesn't mean he isn't a little salty when it comes to Michael Jordan. Or at least that's what it seems like. You see, some people think that he is a low-key hater. I mean, I would like to think that he is not a hater, but it's hard when it appears like he's been taking subtle jabs towards Mike throughout the years. First of all, he had no problem straight up saying that he thinks LeBron is the go. You know, what, what, what is your thoughts on LeBron James and where he rests uh, on, on the well, all-time conversation, well, the goatness, if you will? He's, he's, he's going to he's gonna pass everybody. LeBron is, yes, the chosen one in that regard. Yeah, he's going to be the guy at the, at the end of the day. He's going to be the guy who reestablishes the bar for what the goat is. I mean, I get it, he is entitled to his own opinion, but he didn't even mention Jordan once. And I believe that was on purpose. Kind of like what he did when he was naming his top five NBA players of all time. I heard that you have a list of the top five players in NBA history. Your list. And it omits somebody that, that I mean, it, to me, it's blasphemy that he wouldn't be on the list, but I want you to let the world know what your list is of the top five players in NBA history as far as you're concerned. My top five. Yes, sir. My top five. Bill Russell, I saw Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, and Jerry West. It's my top five. <laughs> now, sure, he did make it clear that those are his all-time favorite players, so Skip Bayless took it upon himself to ask the question we really want to know. Forget about your favorite players and give us your Mount Rushmore. And and feel free to put the I, doctor on there. I, I try to stay out of that. You, you don't want to there he goes again avoiding the elephant in the room which is michael jordan and that's when skip couldn't take it anymore and just straight up asked him about mj go ahead, go ahead. let me ask before we leave this behind okay just give us your perspective so so that i don't think that the doctor needs a doctor on this okay <laughs> on michael jordan just your yes. view of michael's career michael probably won't replace bill russell as the greatest champion. Um, Michael caught it at the right time. So don't say Michael's the greatest because of six rings or Robert Ory is the greatest because of seven rings. Don't, don't make that the only criteria. Okay, what if you forget about the rings? Who's the greatest player? I go back to my favorites once again. I'm not kidding. This is literally the look that Stephen A. Smith had on his face while listening to Dr. J give his answer. It just seemed like he was doing everything in his power to not acknowledge Jordan's greatness. Just acting very stubborn until Skip literally had to pry it out of him. I don't think MJ would have even been brought up if it was up to Irving. And here he is switching up his answer once again. But does LeBron have the potential to be the greatest of all time, and how does he do that? I, I think for him to do that, to me, he's got to surpass Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He's the best who ever played in the NBA. So to recap, he basically insinuated that LeBron will be the GOAT when it's all said and done when he was on the Rich Eisen show. He didn't even have Jordan in his top five when he appeared on first take and then said that Kareem is the GOAT right here when he didn't even have Kareem in his top five previously. I mean, yeah, some people do consider Kareem the GOAT, but you can just tell that this was a shot towards MJ. He also went on the Dan Patrick show and said that Jordan was the junior version of himself when he first came into the league. While I do get what he's saying, I just think it's kind of weird to compliment yourself. 
Back when Jordan was considering coming out of retirement and returning to the Bulls in 1995, Irving was very open about how he thinks it's not a good idea for Jordan to come back, almost discouraging MJ to return, which made people think that Irving must have had an ulterior motive. What if the reason he didn't want Jordan to come back was because he feared that Jordan would accumulate even more success than he already had up until that point, which would overshadow Dr. J's accomplishments even more. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Jordan would eventually three-peat once again for the second time after coming out of retirement. All I'm saying is, it's very interesting that Julius was very vocal about how Jordan should just enjoy himself and not come back to the game. Some people do wholeheartedly believe that LeBron is the GOAT, like Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer. But when it comes to those two, they absolutely hated Michael Jordan, which makes me think, what if Dr. J is in the same category as Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer? What if he deep down resents Michael Jordan for surpassing him? And that's why he refuses to even mention Jordan when discussing the GOAT conversation. I just think it's not a coincidence that pretty much every player who didn't like Jordan leaves him off their all-time list. And I got and I got um, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Dr. J, um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and Magic. The doctor may have been the most popular player in the game back in his days, but I think it's safe to say that MJ definitely eclipsed him in popularity. 